Thank you, sir. And after uh, two wonderful, challenging but privileged years serving in your country, Afghanistan, for the two years before I came here a few months ago, it's a great privilege to be introduced by you, sir. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to, to participate in this splendid event this year. Um, and I'm particularly pleased because the British Council which some of you may know better than others, uh, but it's an organization which has for 80 years been dedicated to the subject of your conference. Um, and we operate and work in what you call cultural diplomacy um, in 110 countries around the world, perhaps particularly in countries where the cultural differences between my country, the UK, and that country are, are excitingly pronounced and diverse and different. So we have very big operations, for instance, across, the, uh, across North Africa and the Middle East, across uh, India and South Asia, China, and so on. Um, we um, do this work because for one sort of overriding reason. We believe that what we call cultural relations are quite simply the most essential dimension for achieving global development, global security, and global prosperity. Cultural relations is the phrase we prefer to use rather than cultural diplomacy or public diplomacy. Um, and I think the reason for that is that we tend to think that diplomacy is invariably um, a government-to-government -government agenda uh, with, quite rightly, the self-interest of each uh, country involved in that diplomatic engagement. Uh, we believe that public diplomacy tends to be, again, rather a government-to-people uh, kind of contract, where the government of one country is trying to encourage and uh, explain and stimulate the people of another country. Whereas cultural relations, we believe, captures what is most essential, and that is the people-to-people -people relationship, particularly in this 21st century world of, uh, of, uh, of the power of pe popular engagement. Uh, we believe that cultural relations is always trying to uh, work for long-term, mature understanding and relationship, rather than trying to deal with short-term political issues, which have often er derived from longer-term issues. We believe that cult cultivating cultural relations um, creates a level playing field between both sides, and therefore is more likely to avoid the dangers always there of one side or the other, thinking that propaganda is somehow at play and avoiding that sense which the questioner put, how can you stop this feeling like an invasion or a threat of a culture into your country if you're actually trying to establish a relationship on a level playing field? Um, <clears throat> and cultural relations acknowledge, as in any relationship, that it's both sides that are willing to be changed and transformed and are willing to learn, rather than one side endlessly trying to explain themselves to the other side, that it is a learning process, mutual. And that the ultimate credit of cultural relations is this strange but all-important word called trust, which is a deep-rooted, needs to be a deep-rooted appreciation of cultures between themselves. Trust out of which will grow um, the readiness to accept uh, negative political happenings in the recognition that there is a deeper understanding which, which goes beneath that. Um, 9-11, that iconic date, changed many things, but one of the things it changed was a recognition amongst uh, decision makers and politicians worldwide that culture was important, that instead of it being that kind of recherche nicety on the side, uh, actually it's culture that undercuts politics in the most powerful way, and that um, the kind of things that happened on 9-11 were as much culturally motivated as they were politically or economically because of the fundamental aspect of distrust of peoples of different value systems um, on that occasion willfully refusing to accept and understand each other's value systems, which is a cultural, a cultural action. What we need, I think, in any uh, country, serious country's foreign policy certainly applies in the UK. I wouldn't presume, despite the title of this conference, to speak for the US, but I'm sure it applies to the US as well, is a recognition that any foreign policy must recognize cultural relations, cultural diplomacy, not just as a, an attractive added extra, but as a fundamental organic aspect of what, of what foreign policy wants to achieve. 
needs to cultivate robust discussion and analysis of the power of cultural relations, cultural diplomacy, public diplomacy, to impact on geopolitics and world issues. Uh, but more, beyond the discussion and the analysis, somehow or other we have to find ways of turning that talk into real cultural interventions. We need to materialize and substantiate the results of this thinking and turn them into some kinds of actions and projects and interventions which really enable peoples around the world to collaborate and thereby to understand, build trust. We need to find the means for cultural initiative, cultural interventions, genuinely to help heal deeply troubled societies, communities, and nations, to try and help um, iron out the lines of international fracture. Um, the work of cultural relations is, in fact, most needed in places where the internal social architectures of countries are broken, or where foreign affairs are damaged by the grating of cultures against each other, and by the willful or accidental, but often willful misreading of cultures which find themselves in conflict. This is the kind of agenda, I think, which we can explain as post 9-11, most tragically, most recently in this country, post Benghazi. Um, we need to advocate and define practical possibilities for using cultural initiatives to help understand the cultural causes of extreme political tension, to help prevent conflict, to help pacify troubled situations, and to help rebuild community and friendship and cooperation in post-conflict scenarios. This is where cultural relations have got to be brought to bear most strongly in this uh, current decade. And of course, by culture, I'm meaning something which goes way beyond the arts. It embraces education, civil society, governance, human rights, yes, the arts, science, language, uh, international communications, and perhaps at a broader level, concepts of home and homelands, concepts and opportunities and problems resulting from mobility, and transnational mobility in particular. These are two of the big agendas which drive through cultural relations in the modern world. Now, some people, some pundits would question whether cultural activity can in any way really improve or help serious cases of political or economic conflict, both within nations, civil unrest, civil war, or between nations, states of standoff, uh, cold war, or even armed combat. These people would say that, be concerned that culture primarily manifests itself as kind of artistic products and happening which however where they are just too marginal and too dilettante to influence states of mortal combat or dangerous breakdown in international or civil relations. <clears throat> but let's not forget, culture is not separate from people, their identities and society. Culture is not some kind of sociological category which can be separated from the communities it describes. Culture is organic. It's the lifeblood. Culture is our primary means of identifying and describing the different groups, societies, and communities that do make up this diverse but complex world. And all people, all of us, are first and foremost imbued with their, our cultures, such that every aspect of a person's social being or even their individual identity is culturally conditioned. And that includes their disposition towards politics and power, their disposition towards economics and value, and their disposition towards religion and belief. Culture is the key determinant. And the reasons for most of the major conflicts in the 21st century, in the last 20 years or so in particular, I would claim, are as much cultural as they are uh, political or economic. Most conflicts and wars of of the past 10 years have derived from hostility, distrust between value systems. Essentially, value systems are essentially cultural paradigms. Um, they've derived as much from this as they have from any obvious political enmity or economic threat. Culture is, as it were, the historically determined deep sea swells beneath the surface of the waters and the kind of politics of the day I see as the kind of choppy waves of the surface, but it's the underlying cultural, um, big cultural swells that are determining the movement of the seas on which we ride. 
Now, if cultural distrust and cultural threat are root causes of international conflict, uh, then we should be right to expect that it's cultural dialogue and cultural rapprochement that might be make a strong contribution to resolving those conflicts. Or at least you're not going to be able to begin to resolve any kind of foreign policy conflict unless there is some deep understanding of what were the cultural reasons for that problem having emerged. So culture must be a contributor to resolution and appeasement. Knowing your enemy, it's a crass phrase, but perhaps it's right, knowing your enemy in the deepest sense of knowledge might be the primary first means to starting to restore trust and thus the possibility of cooperation. Now over the past decade, I think what we know as globalization has severely accentuated worldwide cultural fissures as it poses a threat to people's rightful ownership, possession of their own identities. People's identities in nations or in cross transnational identities the Kurds, for instance. These identities are of long cultural evolution, and they are potentially undermined by the homogenization which globalization can, might mean, the uniformity which globalization often threatens to different peoples to be imposing upon them. So as the world necessarily uh, sort of mobilizes, willingly or not, as a, as a, as a more singular economic, political, demographic, interdependency, then there's an increasingly sort of popular people-led dynamic which is towards an assertion of cultural independence against that political and economic globalization. Cultural independence, cultural singularity, uh, and a def defiantly protected identity. People hanging on to their identities and values which they see as being under threat. And that's, I think, a reason why in, in the contemporary world we do see so many secessionist movements in nations. Uh, in my own country, uh, the country of Scotland might, across really what is a, 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 frac a line of language difference more than anything else, an historical and cultural legacy difference, might see secession from the United Kingdom. Um, uh, we see secessionist movements in eastern India, in a fractured Belgium, in a still riven Sudan. The main reasons for cultural, um, this kind of micro-movement, is very often uh, uh, a, cultural, a cultural antithesis to, to the powers of globalization. And hence the pulls and threats within multicultural societies, which in some ways resist the melting pot concept, do you want to be a melting pot or do you want to um, collaborate politically and economically within a diverse nation but still retaining your very singular culture and celebrating your very singular cultural identity? And hence the aching need for homelands, um, which are rigorously and sometimes violently expressed by displaced peoples, diasporas and refugees. These are the kind of cultural lines of fracture and interest which I think must govern the understanding of cultural relations within, within foreign policy. The lines of secession, which I just described, are traced along language barriers and along belief systems and historical legacies, as much as they are along um, political power bases or across maps of economic resource. And the concept of home, I believe, is the single governing cultural concept of our times, with its sort of axial stretch between belonging and alienation. What is it to say this is my home in the modern world? Uh, breakdown in cultural relations, I would suggest, is probably the deepest cause of world conflict today. Trust is the currency of cultural relations, what one's trying to achieve. It's its mode of work and its highest value uh, product. And it's erosion of trust, which is the root motivation for many of our contemporary wars, the destruction of the trade towers uh, for actions in Benghazi. It's erosion of trust which underlies the invasion of foreign fields and any edging towards nuclear conflagration anywhere in the world. Um, what should be some of the higher level ambitions for a, for a cultural relations strategy? What kind of cultural interventions we should one try to seek in order to help appease 
uh, troubled scenarios and troubled environments. One whole area is around the way we approach negotiation between, between um, divided peoples. One might imagine negotiations with the Taliban in, you know, or the Haganian in Afghanistan or in Pakistan. And I think one, one ambition that must come through cultural relations is always to enable antagonists seriously to understand who the capital O other is rather than simply focusing on what the other wants or threatens to do. One should encourage antagonists to appreciate where the other side has come from, the historical legacy, which may be determining where the other is trying to reach. We should advocate that in any summit of people in conflict, uh, it must always begin with statements not of, this is our position, which is confrontational, but of, let us start by telling, us, telling you who we are and why we think we are in conflict with you. This is relationship, I think, rather than diplomacy. It's an opening of a door into understanding which must be a preliminary to political negotiation. We must explore the means to identify and advocate the common cultural references and values which all cultural antagonists must share in. What, is it that, what are the values that, in a modern world, we all have to share? And then, having established that, we must recognise and celebrate those other areas of cultural difference and distinction uh, which otherwise distinguish those cultures. And we must educate each community involved in, a, in an antagonism to recognise the specific embracing but ultimately limiting cultural evolution and parameters of their own identity and narrative. That all we are all uh, relative to our own cultural experience and that nobody comes into a forum with a more absolute sense that their cultural identity is more important than any others. Above all, we must instill the realisation that world survival depends now on cohabitation in mutual respect. And this is no longer a bit of rhetoric. It's no longer a sort of do-gooding nicety. The weapons of mistrust, the literal weapons of mistrust and the demographies of fear have now grown to a, a, a global claustrophobic dimension. Survival depends on establishing trust. Um, one might say, OK, it's, it, it, it's great to think that one's got to have cultural interventions in order to, in order to help post-conflict or in-conflict situations. But what other ways one can actually materialise this thinking into activity? Well, there's... I have little time here, but I, w I would just put four or five, four or five areas of, of intervention. One is this whole area of taking the right approach, a cultural approach, an understandingly cultural approach to political negotiation, as I just tried to describe. It always seems to be lacking in, um, in that arena. Secondly, I, I, I take remarks I've heard from USAID and, and also from my own country's equivalent of USAID, DFID. The number of developmental projects worldwide, which they say fail because they were not based on a proper cultural understanding of how communities or societies would be able to receive that particular environmental project or that particular you know, governance project and so on. So a real bringing of cultural understanding into the development agenda. Um, I think we worldwide need to think much more carefully about both school and university curricula and whether it really, really captures um, uh, properly questions of uh, world history, world legacy, world culture, the relativity of cultures and a real understanding by all people, particularly young people in the world, of how they came to be the individual they are, what is their particular cultural legacy, what is it and what isn't it and how does it relate to other things. I think in the arts in particular, we need to encourage them to use our funds for much more of a concept of co-production, in which artists across all the arts, film, the always powerful performance arts, the literary arts, and the visual arts, um, the way actually artists bring their, their individual creative identities into collaboration, such as a sharing of cultures in a creative manifestation of co-production in the arts. And that needs to be given a kind of global movement. Um, 
I think we need to uh, restore an appreciation of the power and importance of the humanities in higher education across the world. There is understandably perhaps such, a, such an, um, an emphasis on science, technology, engineering, management, business studies for very obvious applicable reasons that the humanities uh, are, are seen as the ivory tower subjects. They are not ivory tower subjects. They are the subjects which explore more truly than anything else who we are. And knowing who we are is the great uh, cultural uh, uh, journey that the world needs constantly to be restarting. So perhaps particularly greater understanding of the arts in the universities, a greater understanding of the importance of reading history and, and disseminating history in the right way. And above all, I think uh, cultural relations and foreign policy, and I'll conclude here, needs to address this question of mobility. This is an increasingly mobile world. This is a world increasingly in which people are crossing borders, in which national, national borders no longer define uh, cultural borders. Um, and, uh, and really, a, a, a great foreign policy will not just understand and protect a national interest, but will understand and help uh, and help make creative in the modern world the patterns and demographies of mobility and change, of multiculturalism, of diversity, of immigration, uh, uh, of transnational, transcultural marriage, and so on and so forth, and the increasing number of young people who are born into the world who have two cultural identities or multiple uh, cultural identities uh, and, and preparing for a world which very excitingly is so created in the future. Thank you very much.